Welcome to the Farming Without the Bank podcast, the show with a no BS approach to money, hosted by a farm strategy expert and authorized IBC practitioner. Join us as we get real and expose the flaws of traditional financial institutions in order to help farmers take control of their finances, create peace of mind, grow their wealth, and leave a legacy. Now, here's your host, Mary Jo Ehrman. Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I do appreciate the fact that you are listening. Um, Before I get to the end of the podcast, I am just going to say, please rate these podcasts if this is not your first one or if it is your first one when you get done listening. If you could please give us a review, I would very much appreciate that. People are always begging for five-star reviews, but I want a truthful review. So I do appreciate whatever you're going to leave. And I, again, appreciate you listening. So today, let's talk about the Federal Reserve and fractional reserve banking. I am also going to talk a little bit about just 401ks and IRAs. So basically, the history of money. You know, I did do a podcast earlier. If you've listened to my other podcasts, you know that I have done one podcast, episode number two, on the 103-year-old banking problem. So I have talked a little bit about the history of the farm finance and where that has led us, but a lot of people do not understand the history of our banking and the creation of our dollars and how all that works. And so I don't typically like to get kind of, I call it into the weeds of this because so many people don't understand what's going on. But I do think it is a worthy conversation to have. And I'm not here trying to scare anybody. These are just facts. And I'm just sharing facts about what happened with our dollar. And so let's go back just to 1913. For example, that was a great year, right? We had the Federal Reserve started and that was the first year for federal income tax. And so you can maybe say it was a great year. Some people are going to say it was one of the worst years in history. It is what it is. We cannot change history, but we can change what we're going to do in the future, right? Or we can try to be a part of that change. And so if you've read Nelson Nash's book, you understand that the whole basis of the infinite banking concept that I teach is based on Austrian economics. And with Austrian economics comes the explosion of the Federal Reserve. And us, the Austrians, I don't want to say... Well, whatever, I believe in that same concept, right? But us telling you what happened, because it's funny how our school systems, and I'm going to call them our government-run schools, are not telling us everything that happened. And maybe we learned this in school, and I just missed that day of class. Let's be honest, I wasn't probably the best student, wasn't probably. I'm pretty sure I was not the best student. I went to school to socialize. (laughs) not to learn. Hey man, we lived 15 miles from town and back, you know, back in those days, it wasn't that long ago. I'm not that old, but back in those days, you didn't drive to town every day and you just didn't have the social life that you have now. And so I went to school to socialize and to see my friends. Um, And I'm not the best at memorizing things. So I did not do well in school just because of that. I would always freak out at a test and ultimately it ended in a disaster. Anyway, back to the Federal Reserve. So in 1913, we had the Federal Reserve Act was passed or was created, the evolution of the Federal Reserve. And that is where we got a lot of the wealthy at that point. Um, I don't remember all the the people in play, but we had the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, J.P. Morgan Chase. And these guys are still, these families are still some of the top owners of the big banks in the country. But they all secretly got together on an island called Jekyll Island, and they devised a plan of how to create this Federal Reserve. And it was funny because they were trying to pass it prior to 1913, and people were really in an upheaval about it. And so they never got it passed. So in 1913, that is when it passed. Um, And 
what does it mean? What was the purpose behind it? Well, most people think that the Federal Reserve is a government-owned entity. The Federal Reserve is not government-owned. As Nelson would always say, the Federal Reserve has as much to do with the Feds as FedEx does. Just because the word Fed is in there does not mean it's government-owned, but that is exactly why they named it the way that they did. And the whole point behind it is so that these wealthy families can own and control the money supply of the world. Not the money supply of the United States, but the money supply of the world. And we can really go down a conspiracy rabbit hole here, but this is really just basics, people. If you want to learn more about this, you can read the book Creatures from Jekyll Island. I believe that you can watch it on YouTube as well. Um, if you would rather watch it, it is like 600 pages long. It's a big book. I'm going to be honest, I've never read it. I have watched some of the stuff on YouTube. And then there are some shorter versions that people have written, some kind of keynote important parts that they're taking out and making it a much shorter version. But um, these individuals and these families really wanted to control the money supply. And so by creating the Federal Reserve, they can print money. They are in control of our money supply and they lend money to the banks. So let's just use JP Morgan, for example. Well, obviously he owns JP Morgan Chase Bank. And so the Federal Reserve, a private entity, can now lend money to the banks. Well, this is great, right? So now the Federal Reserve can make money by lending money to the banks. So the bank needs money. So they go to the Federal Reserve and they ask the Federal Reserve if they can borrow money to lend to Johnny. And the Federal Reserve says, yep, I'm going to give you money at a half a percent. And then the bank lends it to you at three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent, whatever the going rate is. So what happened in this process, though, was fractional reserve banking, and if you need to have a picture or an illustration of fractional reserve banking, go onto YouTube and just Google fractional reserve banking. And there's a lot of people that have done some really good videos to illustrate how this works. But what fractional reserve banking is, is if I take a dollar and put it into the bank as a deposit or a loan repayment, that dollar has to be held by the bank. But the bank can then go to the Federal Reserve and say, we have a dollar on our books. I need to borrow $10. And the Federal Reserve borrows them $10 at a half a percent. Okay, so when we think about this, what happened? Where did they get the $10 from? Like, you only gave them a dollar. Now they go to the Federal Reserve and they get $10. And guess what? They're lending that to Johnny. They just lent Johnny $10 because you put a dollar in the bank. What? $10? That's crazy. Well, in 1973, we completely got rid of the gold standard. We no longer had the Federal Reserve no longer had to have all the money that they were matching no longer had to be backed by gold. So since 1973, we've really had this creation of money that is backed by nothing because we can't audit the Federal Reserve. Where is this money? Where, where are they getting these $10? People, it's nothing but a number on a ledger. That's it. That's it. I give a dollar to the bank. The Fed puts $10 into their ledger and rents thin air to the banks. At a half a percent. When we talk about inflation, inflation is the devaluation of our dollar. Because we're creating more dollars, or numbers on a ledger, that don't exist, that aren't being backed by anything. What? So when we look at a bank, and you, a new bank goes up on every corner... Why is that? Why do they beg for your deposits? Why do they beg for your loans? Why do they try to do whatever they can? Because they need your loan repayment. 
They need you to put money in a CD. They need you to put money in a checking account as a deposit so that they can lend 10 times that back out. The bank is making money on interest, but they're making interest on money that doesn't even exist. Doesn't even exist. It's absolutely crazy. So when we get mad because our bag of Oreos is smaller and Walmart is charging more, is it Walmart's fault? Or is it the fact that Walmart has to charge more because everything that happened with that bag of cookies from the beginning of the process to make them to delivery costs more because of the devaluation of the dollar. And I talk about this a lot when we talk about policy premium. Do I have to pay that premium the rest of my life? I'm not going to be able to afford $5,000 in 40 years from now. Really? Because $5,000 in 40 years is not going to feel like $5,000 today. Nelson had a state farm policy that I believe was $388 a year. That policy was from 1954, I think. 1954. $388. That was a big premium back then. Today, that's nothing. So we have to look at the future and say, well, geez, inflation is going to kill our dollar because it is killing our dollar because nothing's backed by gold. And guess what? The Federal Reserve is making all this money off of interest that they're lending to the banks and they're not paying tax on it. They're a for-profit business that is not paying tax. I mean, just get your head around that for a sec. A lot of people think taxes are the biggest Ponzi scheme and Social Security is the biggest Ponzi scheme. Where does fractional reserve banking fit in there? Where does the Federal Reserve fit in there? I mean, when these people are doing things for their pockets, we need to look at what's happening with our dollar and we need to understand why this is why Nelson was sharing the infinite banking concept. This is why Nelson made this his mission while he was alive and why all of us infinite banking practitioners are continuing to carry on this mission is so that we can stop inflation. Because when we borrow against a life insurance policy, the life insurance company cannot go to the Federal Reserve and get money. They can only lend out of the pool that they have. They cannot cause inflation. If the majority of us did this, we would see a huge effect on the banking system and on the Federal Reserve. If, you have, if, if this is something that interests you, I would highly suggest that you read the book How Privatized Banking Really Works by Carlos Lara and Robert Murphy. And Robert Murphy is a PhD in Austrian economics, and he really breaks down the three, him and Carlos really break down the three things that we need to do as a country to get rid of the Federal Reserve and to cut government in half. And really, it's a 10% tipping point because anything in the world is a 10% tipping point. If 10% of the people do it, all of a sudden it becomes popular, you know, Jordan, Nike Jordan shoes, or just think when 10% of the farmers were using John Deere, all of a sudden John Deere became the popular thing. Or Case IH, or whatever the market is, there's always that 10% tipping point. And so this is Nelson's passion. Do again, I've said it before, we sometimes need to use the bank along the way. If we truly want to live by Nelson's passion, we won't go to the bank for anything. We will completely use our policies for everything, no matter the loan rate from the policy, because they cannot cause inflation. They cannot turn money 10 times. Okay, It's all about manipulation. And while I'm on that subject, I want to talk about the manipulation of the stock market as well. Because a lot of people don't understand that IRAs and 401ks were born in 74 and 80. That wasn't that long ago, people. 
And we have a whole generation now that believes that is the only place we can put our money. Before 74 and 80, where were people putting their money? Not in the stock market. That was only where the wealthy people put their money. So those people that retired in the 80s and we saw those huge influxes of rates of return in the 80s, it is because everybody was pushed there. The government said no longer can the employer take care of the employee with the guaranteed pension. The employee must now take care of himself. And we've created people called brokers and we've trained them to help the employee manage their money. And they need to do this outside of their job. So what happened is the employees all quit working and started jumping from job to job before they would stay employed with one employer for a very long time because they knew they were going to have a pension. That was a guaranteed product because those pensions were put into annuity products. So it was absolutely guaranteed. More money was put away because we knew we had to have it. So instead, the government came in and said, no, 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 we have a much better idea. Let me, let me introduce you to the new broker on the corner. And that broker is going to manage your money for you. Instead of having an actuarial number behind it, we are now just guessing and hoping and strategizing on how we can play the market. So we saw these huge rates of return because all the people that weren't in the market were now being forced to go into the market. Well, now that the majority of the population is in the market or knows something about the market, now what? What happens when all those baby boomers pull out money? Just another example of government intervention. Granted, the Federal Reserve is not the government, but it is the people who want to run this country or run the world. John D. Rockefeller was quoted as saying, he wants to control the money supply of the world. Well, where do we have all these central banking systems? We start a central bank. If you're a true conspiracist, we start a central bank in every country we ever go to war with. So I ask you, to just pay attention to that valuation of your dollar. Don't be mad at Nabisco because your Oreos are smaller. Don't be mad at Walmart because they might be charging more for something. But the price of things have to go up because the devaluation of the dollar is happening at a rampant rate. That is huge, 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 huge. And Oreos is one thing. But when we start looking at tractors and farm equipment, that's a whole nother ballgame. And so people are always on, I see it on social media a lot. The cost of whatever in 1970 is the same as 2019. The cost of grain, or this was the price of a tractor back then. Don't forget to figure in inflation. People, when I figure in inflation, we're pretty much sitting even. Everybody thinks that the cost of these things are more today than they were in the 20s and 30s. But if we actually look at what's happened with inflation, things have pretty much stayed the same. You're making the same amount of money and you're paying in the same amount of money. Don't forget inflation and don't forget or don't put your head in the sand and ignore how that inflation is being created. It is the Federal Reserve, a private entity that does not pay taxes, that is creating money out of thin air. It is actually called fiat money. It's a big deal. Okay, I think that I've kind of beat that dead horse today. And I hope that that enlightened you a little bit to maybe do a little bit of YouTubing or Googling on it, maybe pick up a new book and learn a little bit more about that. I know some of you might think, well, it doesn't have a lot to do with insurance, but it does because we can stop the inflation. So please, if you want to hear me talk about something in particular, you are um, welcome to email me at maryjo at withoutthebank.com. And I am happy to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. Or you can go to Facebook, Farming Without the Bank, and you can message me there. I have been getting quite a few messages on there from the podcast, which is absolutely fantastic. Love to hear about them. 
Or you can visit farmingwithoutthebank.com and you can grab the book there because you have to read the book. And then I am happy to meet with you and strategize and see how we can implement this into your system. So you have a fantastic day and I will catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Farming Without the Bank podcast. We hope today's episode has inspired you to take control of your finances in new ways. Don't forget to check out our website, farmingwithoutthebank.com, and engage with us on our Facebook page, Farming Without the Bank. Join us next week as we smash more financial myths and empower you to accomplish your financial goals.